This episode is brought to you by Honda. When you test drive the all-new Prologue EV, there's a lot that can impress you about it. There's the class-leading passenger space, the clean, thoughtful design, and the intuitive technology. But out of everything, what you'll really love most is that it's a Honda. Visit honda.com slash EV to see offers. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. This episode is brought to you by Experian. Are you paying for subscriptions you don't use but can't find the time or energy to cancel them? Experian could cancel unwanted subscriptions for you, saving you an average of $270 per year and plenty of time. Download the Experian app. Results will vary. Not all subscriptions are eligible. Savings are not guaranteed. Paid membership with connected payment account required. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another special preseason edition of Rival Recon, simply named Rivals. Like I said, we'll be speaking to fans, writers, content creators of last season's top six in the Premier League. Ah, joining me this week, we welcome on Phil Costa, co-founder and host of the Football Vision podcast and Ask Blog regular to discuss how Mikel Arteta's Arsenal are looking as they enter another season, looking to compete with City and Liverpool for the very top prize in English football. So, yeah, Phil, it's great to speak with you again. Uh, like, I, mean, I think we're starting to wind up a little bit. Some of the podcasters obviously not doing anywhere near the physical exertion of you know all the players we see on preseason tours and watching too much Olympics at the moment as well. Uh, and being being a, like an armchair critic as well, I'm not sure if that's happened to you, but watching the gymnastics and any slight uh, failure in movement, I, I, I'm i I'm incredibly critical of as I go and get some more crisps like to, to That's watch. That's the best it. part of the Olympics. You <laughs> you can sit there without any pressure or judgment and just purely judge other people. Um, no, exactly. Athletes who have dedicated years to their craft and their professions. One mistake there on, on the bar, get them out. Get yeah, them out. I'm afraid That's enough. It's not what we're looking for, unfortunately. Uh, I've been <laughs> pretty critical. Uh, and you're yeah, starting to turn my attention. I've not even watched much of the football of the Olympics because I've tried to give myself somewhat of a break uh, from this relentless football. Um, and Thierry Henry is trying to trying to lure me back in with some of these celebrations and the John Philip method, at least say, and the resurgence. But I, I will resist um, because, yeah, of course, the Premier League's soon to be upon us. I think, what is it? Like, is it ne- the next weekend is the Community Shield or something like that. It is. Um, is which is wild. Um, it's already come around. Uh, but before we get into that, I do want to ask you, cast your mind back to the, the final whistle, the final game last season, when that finally went, uh, g- give me a gist of what you were feeling. And I guess um, I'm sure that you know, over time you develop it, you, you have a more sort of like nuanced like version of sort of how you feel about the season, I'm guessing. But like, what were you feeling in that moment? And then also, sort of how do you sort of, what are your overarching thoughts about the season? I was talking about the, the last day of, of last season. Yeah, just, I mean, you know this feeling, right? As a Liverpool fan, you know what it's like to have to go up against this three-point juggernaut that is Manchester City. And, you know, even we, I think we dropped points. We lost one game between January and May. And Mm. uh, that was the home game against Aston Villa. And it felt terminal. It felt terminal because you just think you cannot afford to drop any points. Um and maybe it wasn't as ex- as extreme as it was with you. I think when you when you lost that on what ninety seven points, um, 
we only yeah. lost that on 89 but it's it's just any points dropped feel like a stab in the in in the chest because you just think oh god that's it that's it we've lost our our our, our ground our momentum um and obviously there was still some hope on the final day i think especially when Mohamed Kudu scored just before mm. half time and you think mm, mm, maybe there's a you know a, a chance for us here but realistically it was never uh, going to happen so even before the final day everyone was more in a party mode to to try and celebrate what was the season as opposed to feeling disappointment at losing out because if you just get upset about losing to Manchester City, you you won't enjoy anything. So we've still come a really long way. Um, we like most of our players now, which is something incredibly novel, having hated most of them for, you know, a good few years. Um, mm. And it, it just, you know, at least we can see a positive trajectory or direction of travel, which I think is the most important thing. It didn't feel like a flash in the pan. Um you know, it, it feels like we're here to stay for at least a few more years under Mikel Arteta. And obviously it's hugely disappointing, but ultimately you can still recognize the good that you've done and be happy with how you're playing and, and where you're going. So as I said, you this isn't a unique feeling for us. You know it very well. And mm. the goal is 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 to topple Manchester City and, and hopefully we can do it. Hopefully we can do it this season. Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's funny, actually, as I was writing that question and as, as I was asking it there, I think it was only at that point where I actually, I just remembered that, yeah, of course, Liverpool had been through it. Um, it's just, yeah, that's the effect of, I guess, lots of very good therapy and just <laughs> suppressing those memories <laughs> uh, because, yeah, of course, we've, yeah, of course, we've been through it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, even the, even the Villa or even the Gundogan, uh, sort of like a brace to drag us back from that was, um, was fun as well. Uh, yeah, it's, I think was, I, I speak often with um, a couple of different contributors who join me on these on these shows, and like, the footballing death star of, of of Man City just like looming closer and closer. And I know what you mean. It's it, it feels. I, I think it was last season again. I was thinking about it's just how early in the season you start having to look at results and a draw here and a draw there's just not. You suddenly go, oh no! Like well, a difficult away draw used to be absolutely fine. And I, I remember a couple of seasons ago thinking this is just this is ridiculous that like this early in the season we're having to worry about like maybe not not being all, all, all cylinders or anything like that. But that is that is the reality, uh, the, the sort of distorted reality of what they've created. And I, I mean, like, when you're focusing on the good, you know, the good stuff you saw, the progression you mentioned, uh, the fact that it's not a flash in the pan, like you, you feel this is going to be a consistent growth under Arteta. Because of the players, I mean, a lot of like great performers last season. Uh, who, who do you think was the like the? I, I forget who actually the, was the Arsenal player of the season, but who was the player of the season? And who, who do you think actually went under the radar in terms of like having a really good campaign for you? Mm, it's difficult because we had a, a few really top performers. We had some underperformers as well. I, I look at mm. people like. Gabriel Jesus for various reasons, injury, yeah. couldn't really get into the team with Kai Havertz playing well. Gabriel Martinelli as well, really up and down with injuries. Um, and Leandro Trossard obviously came in and took his place with with a lot of good performances. So in terms of who was the standout performer, I would probably say between two, Bakayo Saka and Martin Odegaard. I think, oh, you know, that won't be a huge surprise to many of your listeners. The, the right side in particular is is brilliant and it's where a lot of the damage comes from this Arsenal team that little triangle between Ben White at right back Martin Odegaard in in central midfield and then Bakayo Saka just um kind of coming in off the right hand side that is where most of our damage takes place and those three in particular were outstanding to be honest they just have this telepathy this wavelength where nothing looks difficult they just know where they're all moving how to combine whether you know, Ben White's going to come inside or go on the overlap. And it just, it's really amazing to watch, to be honest. And those three were really outstanding. I thought Declan Rice had a had a brilliant season. Um, wasn't only playing as the six. There were games where he was pushing forward as a more box-to-box midfielder, as a number eight with Jorginho coming into the team and holding. Um, showed a real appetite for goals and assists, as well as his usual a destructive dual winning game that that most of us know mm. um and i think Jorginho being the player that he is in terms of his distribution 
made it less of an issue for Rice, who I think has maybe been over criticized in terms of his his progressive passing. But when you can kind of just leave him to go and hunt the ball and use his engine to go and cause damage further forward, that gave us another um, sort of dimension last year, I would say, because uh, we looked really strong and fit in that second half of the season. I, in terms of underrated players, I would say Gabriel. Gabriel is. You know, it happens every year when we signed Jakob Kivior. It was about how he was going to come in and displace Gabriel. And now we've signed Calafiori. And it's all about how he's going to sit next to Saliba at left centre back. No chance. Absolutely no chance. I mean, individually, they're both excellent players. I think Saliba is naturally incredibly gifted. But the pair, how they play as a partnership and as a pairing is amazing because you have the, the kind of cool, calm, collected Saliba who never really looks stressed or, or, or concerned with anything and he's got the distribution to kind of play those balls through the lines and find Erdegaard and find Saka and Gabriel is just the I'm going to kill everything that moves here, you know, and he's such a threat from set pieces he can go one-on-one, -on -one, he can defend those wide areas if the fullback is going forward and I think he's just really generally quite underrated across Premier League watchers or fans mm. maybe not for Arsenal fans because we've seen him play well for for, for three seasons now but I, I don't think he will get many of the plaudits and he deserves it because he's never injured he's always a, a seven out of ten at least um and you know there was a running joke between Arsenal fans last season that we were set piece FC um mm. because we used to score so many and he was a, a huge part of that he you know he's even scored at Anfield so mm. um I think he is someone who maybe went under the radar that deserved a bit more credit is what I would say. Sure, yeah. No, I, I saw trying to contrast similarities in my head to sort of Liverpool players who, do, who don't tend to get those those kind of plaudits. And I think, I think Joe Gomez now start, like, is, to be honest, but I think, yeah, for him, him last season for Liverpool, um, multiple positions, often like played out of position um, and, yeah, somehow managed to stay fit as well, which is the, the longest stretch touch wood that he's... Um, He's been consistently there, but I think yeah, you're right. With with the likes of Van Dijk next to him often, or um, again, to Arsenal for Saliba, they take a lot of the limelight, a lot of the attention. It's 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 difficult to to stand out. Perhaps that even helps at times, right? You can just do your do your job next to the guy who's you know is mm -hmm. going to get a lot of the focus, a lot of the attention. And at the end of the season, you mentioned you're know, feeling obviously disappointed. You know, it's, it is what it is. City are who they are, and the standard is is where it is, unfortunately. Um, you mentioned, though, the consistency. You could see the progression under under Arteta. So like, rather than, I guess, because we're obviously going to talk about transfers, and you mentioned Calafiori there as the one who's come in so far. Um, but in terms of, like, I guess, areas to focus on, it, when you came to end the last season, we're talking about how ridiculous the margins are here. Like, how do you, like, find you? How do you get this side better? But you mentioned a couple of players that perhaps there who underperformed like, what are the areas where you think that this side needed to focus on if it's going to come back again this season and reach that level, but even go beyond it? Like, uh, you can talk about positions if you want, but you, you can be more general otherwise. I think generally what we'd need to do is is just find that, that extra 5 or 10% in the final third to okay. change games and score goals when, when things are going against us. I mean, we had a brilliant season in terms of the numbers, um, I'm just going to get the table up here because mm. I, I can't remember off by heart, but um, we scored a huge amount of goals um, and defensively we were outstanding. We only conceded 29 and we scored 91. So that's only five goals away from City. But within that season, there were five times that Arsenal were held to a, a, a scoreless game. Mm. So ideally, you'd you'd look at that and, you, and you'd want to see if Saka's not firing, if it's a Jesus not firing, if it's a Gabriel Martinelli not firing, how can we find an extra 5 or 10% from somewhere mm -hmm. just to get us a win away at Goodison Park or Villa Park when things aren't going extremely well? If we've been below par, how can we turn that 0-0 performance or a 1-0 performance into a, into a win or a draw? That's where I would be looking um, because ultimately, pieces, right? I, mean, I, I was I was thinking back to Liverpool's successful seasons and the, mm -hmm. the season as well, and it was. I think people sometimes actually 
because of who Liverpool have been, the different incarnations of Liverpool over the past number of seasons, I think sometimes people forget what the Liverpool team that won the league actually was. And yeah, a load of set-piece goals to, to get ahead in games or when when needed, like when we couldn't find a way to break through. And that was, you know, we had to had our strongest front three. So like, it's like perfectly legitimate that's going to happen, right? Saka's not always going to be able to dig people out. Martinelli as well, Jesus. Um, so the fact that you did that as well, I mean, I was thinking like that, that, that's a string to your bow, right? Being good at set pieces. You've got to find some some other route as well. Like, let's, is it goals from midfield is going to be the next thing? But you're going to tell me that you did that as well, right? But maybe, potentially. I think we found we found something good with Kai Havertz up front last yeah. season um, because I, I, I think it was quite clear he was signed as a as a number eight to kind of go and support players in in the final third. Maybe he can be that box crusher, someone who can run late into the box, Mm. um, get on the end of crosses and headers and and just try to make a difference that way. But it wasn't working for the first three or four months of the season. Um, And we know that he's played centre forward before, right? He's played there for Chelsea, he's played there for Bayer Leverkusen, played there for Germany. And what he offered us was a real focal point up front. so if we can maybe get some players in and in and around him, I think Declan Rice has has the potential to hit double figures um, for goals. I think Erdegaard certainly has the capacity to do it. Um, beyond that, it's a bit difficult because we've sold Emil Smith Rowe, who yeah, who has found it really difficult to break through under Arteta in the last eighteen months or so, and a lot of that has been down to injury. Um, but you look at midfielders who can score goals, and he is a very natural person and prospect for that and I I look at some others I think Fabio Vieira Mm. hasn't quite lived up to expectation yet so he can certainly contribute more from midfield I think Ethan uh, Ethan Nuneri is also coming through 17 years old he has a bit more punch and sort of pizzazz in the final third to be able to do something so maybe definitely goals from midfield could um could be something different. Um, Do you think Fabio Vieira? Because whenever, whenever I saw see Fabio Vieira, and the thing that comes across to me is how slight he is. Right, you, know, you can say he's, he's, his 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 sort of physical frame. And do you, do you think that's the reason why at times he hasn't been trusted in in some of those games? The fact that we're maybe concerns about how robust he's going to be. We, we know how combative the Premier League can be, especially in midfield. That's why you want someone who's built like Declan Rice and can 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 play like that. Do you think that's been part of the reason that's held him back from? from getting more of a mainstay. Like in games where you know you're going to control loads of possession, perhaps he makes more sense. But is, do you think that's that's what's held him back? At BlueNile.com, you can find endless ways to make your moment sparkle. From classic and timeless jewelry gifts to creating the custom engagement ring of her dreams, all at prices you won't find at a traditional jeweler. And right now, you can save up to 40% on fine jewelry and 25% on engagement ring settings during the Blue Nile Anniversary Sale going on now. Go to BlueNile.com to shop the Blue Nile Anniversary Sale and save up to 40%. That's BlueNile.com. L is yep, for the way that's who you think it is. The Grimace Mug. The, the Hello Kitty Keychain. Barbie herself. For a limited time, your favorite McDonald's collectibles filled with memories and magic are now on Collectible Cups. Get one of six when you order a collector's meal at McDonald's with your choice of a Big Mac or 10-piece McNuggets. Come get your cup while you still can. And participate in McDonald's for a limited time while supplies last. L. Yup, that's who you think it is. The Grimace Mug. The Hello Kitty keychain. Barbie herself. For a limited time, your favorite McDonald's collectibles filled with memories and magic are now on Collectible Cups. Get one of six when you order a collector's meal at McDonald's with your choice of a Big Mac or 10-piece McNuggets. Come get your cup while you still can. And participate in McDonald's for a limited time while supplies last. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. (laughs) This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN 
make sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. It's difficult to say. Again, he's someone who's really struggled with injury. Um, so right. he's never been able to put a consistent run of games together. He's played on the right. Then he's played at, uh, in midfield as the kind of left eight and sometimes on the left. So he hasn't really been afforded a consistent run in the team. And when he does play, he's usually playing in games where, you know, it's early stages of domestic cups or coming on late as a substitute when it can be difficult to contribute or you're playing in a in a much changed team, for example, where, um, you know, in Europe, it could be a dead rubber and then you're starting a game when the team lacks a, a fluency and a connectivity. So again, it's been difficult for him, but I think after a couple of seasons in the Premier League now, you're looking at him to kind of, first of all, define a position. Um, and and also you, you should know what the Premier League is about now. I think he's got good goal scoring ability. He's not really a creative player. I see him much more as a, Bruno Fernandes style of guy who can be okay. um, sort of an end product guy instead of someone who's going to knit everything together and, you know, dictate the game like a Martin Odegaard, for example. So he for sure can contribute. Um, and he, he needs to look at Leandro Trossard, really, because Leandro Trossard doesn't really have any outstanding physical attributes. Um, but what he can do is strike a ball very hard off both feet. Um, and, yeah. and that can make a difference. You know, you, you don't need to play like Bukayo Saka every game. Sometimes you just need to be um, in in and around the box, aware of your movement. And if you get 10 minutes at the end of a game, how can you contribute that way instead of, you know, feeling hard done by to not be able to contribute from from the starting or, or, or from the first minute? Yeah, we, we, we do, we, obviously there's so many similarities between between these squads in terms of Liverpool and Arsenal, right? And even even you, you go down to the, those individual roles, like you're talking about, like Trossard to me was just like so, so reminiscent of of Jota in terms of sort of his role. Exactly, role. very similar players. Like don't don't need to mess around. At times you go football, you're playing football, <laughs> uh, <it's really laughs> struggling with like some key key concepts. Uh, and then other times, like, oh, you're very effective. Like you're effective at that bit. Okay, like th- that that's what you what you love, like scoring goals with any sort of scuffed finish at times. Because at, yeah, at times, we, we were looking, you'd look, we'd be looking at uh, Nunes. You go, so much about what you've just done is great. And it's just that final finish. In fact, like, loads of times you hit the ball really cleanly, just like straight at the goalkeeper or the finishing was poor. And you like, you want to be more like Jota. You want to be more like a Trossard, where it doesn't have to be pretty. Just like, just make sure that you do that important bit. And I think, yeah, at times it can be very underrated. But I, yeah, certainly when he went missing last season for Liverpool for a little bit, it was um, it was a big loss because those guys are very useful. <laughs> Come on, no frills, score, go and play FIFA, um, as I believe he loves to do. So, uh, and I guess that brings us on to that that chat about new players and you know when players underperform, you don't always have to replace them or anything like that. Or very often that's especially now, that's very often sort of the discussion that happens. If you've underperformed, uh, yeah, it's time to get rid. And yeah, I don't know whether any of those conversations that happened around the likes of Jesus or Martinelli, you know, as soon as, soon as their form dips, you know, like, is it, is it time to to sell, replace? Um, I'm sure there's been those discussions. But Calafiore has come in so far, sort of left side of centre-back, really classy um, sort of season at Bologna, wasn't he? And, and, and I think then um, also he's in the Euros, looked really classy as mm-hmm. well. Um, I guess what what were the areas for you that you think okay these are the priorities um, in terms of squad surgery I think we needed a left back to be honest because we've we've struggled to really nail someone down there I mean last season or sorry the season before it was Alexander Zinchenko who came yeah. in from Man City and, and just kind of changed our world completely I mean we were, we were watching games and seeing our left back have 
over a hundred touches and we were just thinking what the hell is happening here um because we've been used to Kieran Tierney who in his own right is a very good player solid player but is much more traditional in terms of how he just likes to get his head down and run to the byline yeah so when we saw Zinchenko come in it was just like what is happening here him and Thomas Party in the middle were just bossing games um fizzing passes through the line um but then last year was was a difficult one I think a lot of teams figured him and us out with Zinchenko at left back um and he's had injuries so we brought Yuri and Timber in played 45 minutes at left back and then did his ACL so we lost him for the whole season then Tomiyasu went into that left back role again very accomplished defender a bit like Cesar Azpilicueta you know can play across Mm -hmm. the back four very diligent in his defensive work good technical level on both feet then then he got injured so then it was Jakob Kivior to come in who by all means is fine but if you're trying to challenge for the league and the Champions League he's maybe not the player who's going to give you enough in that position so I I think we did need a left back Um, I would have gone for someone a bit more two-way in terms of their ability to contribute in the final third and uh, as well as defensively. But I think what Calafiori allows us to do with, with him at left back is is be secure, but also he is a bit more brave in how he likes to go forward. So if we're comparing him to a Tomiyasu or a Kivior, he's got m- way more in his game going forward in terms of that bravery, that ball carrying. He can drop into midfield if needed. So I think overall it's an exciting signing, especially as he... He feels a bit like the flavor of the month, as you say, coming off that that good season with Bologna and also impressing at the Euros. So we're all quite happy with that one. Um, now the links are kind of centered around Mikel Marino, who could potentially be coming in as our, uh, you know, a bit more experience and depth in midfield. He feels a bit like an adult in the room, you know, when you just get players who have been around, know their jobs, can can yeah. physically handle themselves in in this league. Um, and that could be a cheap deal, a kind of market opportunity for someone who's heading into the final year of their deal. Um, so I would be surprised if that one doesn't get done. Um, yeah, where is he at the moment, sorry, Marina? Real Sociedad. Sociedad, okay. Sure. Yeah, he's been there for six years now. So I think it's it's the last chance for him to get a big contract, play at another level. Um, and I think Arteta really likes him just because he's just a big guy who wins his jewels, basically. Um, but he's got a lot about him in possession as well. I mean, some people will have seen him for Spain during the Euros. Um, but where I'm really looking for Arsenal now to, to kind of go big is, is someone up front. Um, whether that could be a, a wide forward or a centre forward, I don't really have a preference because I think Gabriel Jesus can play both wide positions as well as the centre forward. We've got Martinelli, Saka, um, Haver. So it's not a bad pool of options. But if you're really looking to take that next step, I think we need something else. And there were links to Nico Williams, although it looks like he might be staying at Athletic now, which is incredible after the Euros that he had. Um, There's been links to Pedro Neto, but Wolves want a big fee and he's got a dodgy injury record. Um, So you're always a bit hesitant to drop, let's say, 50 or 60 million on someone like him. There's been other links as well. Even today, Kingsley Coman was linked with, with Arsenal. Um, I think Bayern are kind of ready to to part ways with him and there could be a deal um, alone with an option to buy, for example, which doesn't give you a huge amount of jeopardy for someone with a big injury record. So we we need someone in, in those forward areas because I think the club are going to sell Eddie and Ketia. Um, okay. they, they're going to sell Reese Nelson. Uh, Emil Smith-Rowe's already gone. So mm. whichever way you look at it, that's that's leaving us short. So I would be really, really frustrated to see Arsenal, whether that's Edu, whether that's Mikel Arteta going to another season without proper backup for Bukayo Saka because we just run him into the ground every year. Um, And I'm kind of worried if that trend continues where he's going to end up physically because he's just he's just playing a stupid amount of football. Yeah, no, of course. And I think, I mean, I, I th- there, were, there were links to Chesco and there, like uh, earlier in the winter. Yeah, well. earlier on in the summer. I think, to be honest, I've heard quite reliably that we were ready to go all in on that. Okay. Um, he didn't have the greatest Euros, did he? So that, that yeah, he didn't have the greatest Euros, but he signed a contract with RB Leipzig beforehand. So okay. um, I think the, the 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 view from him was that he, he needed a bit more time yeah. to find his game, get some minutes at, uh, in the Bundesliga and then maybe have his big move next summer, which I can completely respect. Um, 
minutes are the most valuable thing for young players and he's going to get more of them at Leipzig than he is at Arsenal. So, um, yeah. but yeah, there's even Victor Gjokere, someone like that, I think had an incredible season. But after one year in Portugal, you're just a bit hesitant to again spend what sporting would want for him. So it's a very difficult striker market at the moment. I think things will happen towards towards the latter stages of the window. I think Victor Osimhen is one to keep an eye on because uh, Napoli are kind of ready to part ways with him. Um, but yeah, there's not there's not a huge amount out there apart from even looking in the Premier League. I see Alexander Isak, maybe Ivan Toni, uh, Dominic Solanke, again, good player, but is he worth yeah, yeah. 5 million? Not sure, but we, we've kind of lost the whole concept of value in the Premier League now. Yeah, I can... I can tell you whenever I do speak to Solanke fans, yeah, they 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 do fully fully back him, fully believe he's 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 worth that money. Now it certainly looks like he's developed loads since he was at Liverpool, um, when it was like he could do everything else apart from the the scoring bit, and now he seems to have added that to his game as well at, at the lower level, but also in the in the Premier League. And you mentioned a couple of different players there. You mentioned like taking the pressure off Bukayo Saka, uh, in in particular. Is there a, is there a kind of striker that you're looking at? You, you, you think that Arteta would he wants this kind of profile of striker to like, that would best suit the system that you have? I mean, again, it's it's about who's available, right? But if if there was a like if you could mold a profile of striker, what kind of striker is it that you think would would fit best in this um this team? I think Arsenal in in their current iteration would need a bigger striker in in kind of the the Havertz mold just because we play that way now. As I said, two seasons back, Gabriel Jesus came in and we were kind of playing the false nine with him basically bopping around all over the place wherever he wanted to be, and he was he was incredible until he got injured. I mean, I was amazed at what we were watching. I'd never seen anything like this for Arsenal, um, but it hasn't quite worked out for him over the last twelve months. If we are going to bring somebody in, it would have to be a bigger striker, I would say, um, purely because that is the way we play now. We like to get bodies in and around the penalty area. We like to get Bukayo Saka and Gabriel Martinelli running into that space in behind. Um, Avos did a great job last season. He really sort of showed what he was about. I think when when players are confident, you can see a different side to them. Um, and earlier on in the season, when he was playing in midfield, it was all you know, so timid and he wasn't getting involved at all. He was so passive in possession, wasn't doing enough physically. Um, and then as soon as we moved into centre forward, he was winning winning aerial duels, scoring goals, scoring from set pieces, you know, and he showed a bit of fire, a bit of fight. And I was going to say, yeah. if someone was going to come in, it would have to be in that mould, I think, to suit what, what we currently do. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's, a, it's that kind of profile. Yeah. I mean, the the Tony links were were, were interesting to me because he didn't really like sound like that kind of striker. But when you look at how he how he plays, he could, he could do a lot of that, a lot of that work. But yeah, we'll see. He seemed pretty adamant he was moving, um, which Brentford fans weren't weren't super happy with, considering how long he'd made them wait for him to come back and play last season. I I, I think he'll get a move. I I think, think he'll get he a move towards the end of the window, maybe at a cut price deal. Okay. Um. I know that Brentford signed Igor Thiago to did, to kind yeah. of eventually replace him, but then he got injured. So that gives Brentford a little bit of 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 ground to be like, look, sixty million is the price, but I think for a twenty eight year old striker with one year left on his deal, I think maybe teams could be tempted to come in towards the end of the window and say, what about forty million? Uh, you know, and that puts Brentford in a difficult place because if Ivan Tony pushes for the move. Um, they don't really have much uh, to stand on there. But I mean, if if, it, if we're talking 35, 40, 45 million, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to it for Arsenal. Yeah, and no, that feels like trying to spot the opportunity, um, which is, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I think it's been kind of a weird summer window so far with, with so much football taking place. And of course, even the Olympics still going on at the moment. It feels like there's a, like a whole heap of, of transfers that are going to happen this this month, um, but maybe towards the latter part, I know Liverpool fans are hoping for a movement. Thank, thankfully, Ornstein did his uh, klaxon this morning that there is there is some desire, I think, for Liverpool to, or they're looking for a six. And you can only imagine what's what Liverpool Twitter's been like today. Is anyone well, getting their FB ref pages out? Delighted. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Who's it going to be? Like YouTube compilations of, uh, of the mystery six. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
these are all, all, all those charts of you know um exactly where players sit on you know like the axis on progressive passes and like you know like uh, defensive like interceptions all, all this stuff and I'm like yeah you, you you get the usual stuff if he's not on here I don't want him at my club. It's okay. It's your club. Okay, interesting. Okay, we'll see. Let's see if he's uh, if he's signed. Um, yeah, I'm going to trust the folks. I think who are back in charge at, in terms of transfers of Liverpool. Seemed they seemed to know what they were doing beforehand. So uh, yeah, I, I have my preference for sure. I guess it, 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 we'll, we'll see who's who's out there. It'd be, it'd be nice to get Alan Varela if that's a possibility. But yeah, we'll we'll see. They they know more. And uh, I want to talk off the pitch a little bit and. Now, sometimes I talk, talk to people, you know, off the pitch can be a really big topic. It could be some horrible ownership, like takeover going on. Um, you know, it could be the, the Everton situation. There, there's, there's so many things you can do. At certain clubs where it's lots more disruption. Arsenal's much more stable now, uh, of course, I think, than, than it used to be. So there's not too much to talk about off the pitch. Uh, but I guess Arteta's, who I wanted to ask about, really, um, just how you think he's developing as a coach, um, and in, into that role, a you know, big role as Arsenal manager, clearly, you know, a, a lot of money been been spent now to back him. Clear progression, as you can say, you can see that uh, progress. Is it now about I think just needing to get over the line in a couple competitions, even if it's not the biggest one? We know how distorted the Premier League is, but how do you think he's doing? And so, so do you think that this season is he'll be under even more scrutiny? Do you think? I mean, or I mean, he seems pretty settled. Yeah, I think we're we're all really happy with him, to be honest. I mean, there will always be things that you can pinpoint or or pick out that he can maybe yeah. do better. And I think learning to trust the, the squad players more could be something a, a bit important because when we, you know, even in small FA Cup games or Carabao Cup games, he's like, okay, Bakayo Saka's starting up front again. And it's like, why? Why are you doing that? And then he comes out after the game and says... Oh, but if you want to be a top player, you have to play 70 games per season. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe not against Sunderland away. You know, it's or, exactly the same thing for Liverpool fans. Um, last year, that seeing, seeing Van Dyke wind up somewhere, you know, what, why? Why is this guy? <laughs> so I, I, I would maybe look at him and say, can you just show a bit more trust in your squad okay. players? And I completely get that if they aren't to your standards or your levels, you can you can use that as an excuse. But they they're all you've got, you know, and. It's not an issue for us if if you can kind of look at the bigger picture sometimes instead of thinking every game is a must win game, um, or even just you know if Saka's not not playing well, take him off for fifteen minutes. You don't need to play. He doesn't need to play the ninety every week. Um, the same with any player really, not just Saka. Mm-hmm. If someone's flagging a bit or not playing their best, just try somebody else. Um, so that will be something I'm looking at at this season to try and especially now that we're we're hoping to go far in Europe, you need to manage minutes. And I don't want us to burn out by March, for example, when I think if we're 5-0 up in January against Crystal Palace, can we just, you know, give, give someone a rest? Um, and also, I would just... what what there, there were a few issues last season where we maybe lacked a plan B. And... Yeah. That is what is is something that I would be looking at for for him to maybe find another way to be able to break teams down because when they it's incredibly difficult and I know I'm taking this for granted but when they do sit in a deep block can you just find another way to do something instead of playing how you would normally play um, against a mid block or a press you know sometimes different game sequences or game states call for different tactics. Um, and I think there were times last season where he persisted with things when they maybe weren't the most fluid or, or you know, especially around Christmas time when we dropped points, we lost at home to West Ham and then we lost to Fulham away. Mm. Um, and he played the same team twice. And you could see that there were people tired, not at their best. The midfield balance wasn't quite right. And, and to see him start the, the same team twice in a row was just a bit like, you know, you haven't seen it work. So what makes it? work today away from home and you know try things just try a couple of things I know you don't want to make five changes but maybe bring someone in take someone out just to give a fresh impetus to the team because things can get stale um and I think you know what you'd like to do is is maybe just freshen things up when you see an opportunity to do so but other than that we're all really happy with Arteta I think he's going to sign the contract very soon um he seems very committed to Arsenal and what he's been able to do 
in I, I know people point out the money that's been spent which is absolutely fair and true um but our squad was a mess when he took over like people don't realize how in the mud we were with old players on big contracts not bothered about the team you know Aubameyang, Urzo, Mustafi, Socrates, David Luiz, all of these players who were just simply not good enough um, and happy to take their mega bucks every week. What he's done in terms of changing the culture, changing the standards, what it means to be an Arsenal player um, has been nothing short of phenomenal and we're, we're just kind of happy to be on here with uh, for the ride. Hey guys, it's Eddie Gibbs from Anfield Index here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast and I'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends. In the current climate, it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free. At Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community, where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, AnfieldIndexPro.com. Dot com. Join today. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.